Hello and well met. This is Laren of the Fantasy Grounds Academy. Today I'm going to do some line of sight and lighting on a custom map from the Lost Mine of Fandelver series. These are actually created by Chris McDermott as his own recreation of some of the maps. They are under the Wildershire maps on his website, which I'll include in the links. I'm going to do the line of sight on this custom map from start to finish. I'm going to do some of the line of sight, some different things that you might want to include in your own maps. I do this as not only to share the uh, challenge of it and to help with others that may want to do the same thing, but I also do it for practice. And that's one of the best ways to learn how to use the map tools. And people get very frustrated with it only after using it once or twice. You really have to practice the tools and understand what they do, learn the shortcuts and learn what not to do. So. Without further delay, I'm going to start creating this map. We're going to start from scratch. Um, the map is already built, but I'm going to take and put the line of sight, the lighting, some assets, those sort of things. So maybe this will help you, I hope. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. So right now I have the ultimate version of Fantasy Grounds. I do have some modules loaded. So I have like the SRD. I have the Lost Mine Offend Over module. I have some pregens, and I also have some maps that I really don't need to load, but I went ahead and did that in case I need more material. So I just have a minimal amount of content here loaded, so I don't clutter fantasy grounds, I don't create a lot of overhead, I want to keep it minimal as possible. The next thing is the assets. So if I come over to my assets folder, I've already added some third party maps, which are these Wildershire maps. And they are very close to the original Lost Mine of Fendover maps. So if I click on this campaign folder, which only actually creates when you add images, so you would do that through the folder button down here on the bottom of this frame. So once you add those and you click the refresh button, the campaign folder will show up. And these will be exclusive to the campaign that you're in. If you want the maps to exist in all of your campaigns, such as your D&D campaigns, you want to put them in the data folder. But in this case, they're in their own special unique folder. They're only going to be accessible in the game through this session. So if I click on campaign, if you have any images that you've added and you refresh, they should show up in your assets once you've added them. Generally, you want to keep the file size down and the dimensions of the maps. One of the most common mistakes that everyone makes, including myself, is to add huge maps. It's not really necessary and it will cause a lot of overhead, especially when you're trying to share that across your network with your players. Your bandwidth will shrink very quickly if you use too many large images. So I'm gonna start with the Kragma hideout. There are many variations of it here, but what I wanna do is go ahead and load one of these up. So here's the lit version. There's the non lit version. There's a flooded version, there's a volcanic one, and then there's just the, the uh, kind of like dark lit one. And then there's a couple other maps by another artist, uh, Angela Maps. So I'm just going to load the very basic generic one. That way I can add assets, I can change the lighting as I go. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. And what you'll get is a preview image. And this one's taking a little bit to load because it's a large map. It is basically uh, a little bit too big dimensionally and file size wise, but since I'm not actually sharing the map over a network, I chose to use a high definition map because I want to be able to show it online. Otherwise, if I was playing, I would definitely convert it down to a smaller file size. But as you can see, it's got a lot of detail and it's pretty good size and dimension. So I'm gonna go ahead and create an image record. So what happens is in your campaign settings over here in images, this will push this over into your images and create an image that you can edit. So I already have these actually loaded in some maps here. And I wanted to just kind of show you how to do this. So I wanna make my own group. So right now there's a folder called my custom maps. We already have this Pragma hideout, so I don't need to be redundant. But once you create this group and you have it selected, when you click create image record, if you don't already have it, it will create uh, its own um, link 
and it will be in this group. This way you can differentiate between other things because when you have a lot of things in uncategorized or in all, it's hard to figure out which is which. So get used to using the groups if you're going to make custom content. In this case, this is for images. So I have a, a group called My Custom Maps, and you create those by clicking Add Category, then you rename it, then you edit it for whatever name you want it, and then you select it. And once you've done that, then you can import your files or you can create a bunch of links at once if you have a bunch of images to import. And then you have a store link. So in this case, I'm just going to close this because I already have the map imported. But I want to go ahead and grab the uh, the regular hideout map, which is the one I wanted to do. And currently, it looks like it already has some of the line of sight done on it. So this is kind of what we're shooting for to start off this series. And as you can see, it's already got a bunch of line of sight and such in there. So this is kind of what you want to achieve once you have your map imported. One of the things I noticed right away on here is there might be too many data points. So that could be a problem when you are using Fantasy Grounds, especially with caverns. So if you look at this area here with all these green dots, that might be a little excessive. So if you're concerned about that or you want to eliminate that problem, you can actually click on, double click on one of these series of dots and you would click on Simplify Selected Occluders. And what that does is it gets rid of some of the points and this way it won't be as data hungry so if I double click and it selects all these points in this series of, of uh, lines and occluders and click the simplify occluders it will cut them down and then you can always go back and just kind of drag and adjust for that if you need to this way um, you're not taking up too much of your bandwidth and data because this does slow down uh, your calculations and such in fantasy ground so this is just a, a way to to help mitigate that. So that's just a, uh, a little tip that we learn as we go kind of thing. It looks like it doubled up on this, so I'm gonna hit Control Z because I don't want that doubled up. There we go. So I must have copied that layer. So if you wanna just select a, a point and drag it, that will allow you to basically to adjust the points if you need to. So that's just a, a, a little tip there um, that I learned over time that makes the mapped tools more efficient and less cumbersome for your table. So for instance, like these images down here, I may not need all these little data points. So this is a tree. So if I double click, that selects all of the different points. And then there's a simplify selected occluders option. You click that. It cuts out some of the points for you. So if you come across a map that has a ton of these little dots, that, that might be a problem. So if you double click and you select simplify selected occluders, that will cut down on some, on some of your occluders. And then if you need to come back and adjust the points, you certainly can later. That's just a tip from, from watching other videos and something that Fantasy Grounds had discovered early on, once they released the map tool, they noticed there was quite a bit of a performance hit if you had too many occluder points. So that's something that would help with that problem if you're having a sluggish performance. So like some of these you can't remove, like you don't want to overdo the um, occluder um, exclusion because it can cause problems. Like you, it can make things to where you know, your your data points aren't going to show up like you want them to. And it might take away a feature that you're actually wanting to hide or, or, or uh, exclude from the vision of the party. So you got to kind of choose your battles. But if you have come across an older map that has a ton of these things selected, like that doesn't look bad too close up. But when you zoom out, that's a ton of, ton of little data points. When you actually come out here, you can see how many there are. There's just quite a few of them. So like this wall, I might double click here and then do the same thing. And that will get rid of some of the lines. But if you get rid of too many, you'll lose some of your features. So just maybe do it once and that should take care of it. If you do it more than once, it's going to take away too many dots. So I'm going to do it again here on these occluders. Kind of clean these up a little. Let's see. Yep. So that's just a, a tip that you can use to, to help... Um, 
you know, make your mapping experience and your game experience a lot more efficient and a lot less headaches. So that's just something that you learn as you go. It's really not something that you would practice normally when you first start because you wouldn't know that. But as you get used to the tool, you'll start noticing that different sized maps and different configurations will cause that problem. So that's just something that uh, you want to be careful with when you are creating this content. So there's just different little tips and tricks that you'll learn along the way that will help you uh, mitigate these problems as they, as they arrive. So I'm going to go ahead and um, reset the map because that's something that that you'll want to do. Or I might even choose a different map. Since this natural cave has already been done, maybe I'll redo the castle. That might be, actually be better. Or maybe just a different variation. So I'll go ahead and close that one. And... I'm going to go back to my assets, go to my campaign folder, or if you have a data folder that has a bunch of maps, you can do that. So let's go with um, the volcanic version, which is kind of cool. I haven't done this one yet. It'll be very similar to the other hideout, except for you have some darker features and maybe you're going to add different lighting. So that might be something that you want to try out when you are using Fantasy Grounds. You can change the type of light that is in, available inside of the caverns. Maybe make it like an orange or kind of a glowing yellow. Just whatever you need to add flavor. So this is going to be a volcanic version of the same type of map. And you can probably use this for fire giants instead of just the Kragma hideout. So that's why it's nice to have a diversified version of different maps so you can use them in different situations. So this might not have anything to do with Lost Mine. So again, I'm going to go to my images folder, open that up, and I have my custom maps thing selected. And as you can see, the volcanic one's already there. But if I wanted to, I can create a new image record and that would put it in that category. So that's already put in there, so I don't have to do that. The only thing I think I will do at this point is actually expand the map so you can see what I'm doing. So it's not so tiny. And I kind of have an idea of, you know, what the optimal size is. So this is kind of uh, what you need to fight with when you first start with the map is, you know, how, how big of a preview window. So this map is oriented in more of a horizontal configuration. So that's kind of how I have this set. And then I'm going to right click and go to view. And then you can go zoom to fit, which will take, take this map up another notch there. And then I'm going to stretch it out to where it reaches there. I don't need this sidebar as much anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and collapse that and just kind of make it really minimal and small so I don't, so I don't really need it. And then there's also a drop down here on the toggle toolbar where you can zoom to fit as well. So there's two ways that you can expand the map. So that's just the first thing that you need to get used to is sizing the frame and getting it to a size that's workable for you. Once you've done that, now you can start thinking about how you want to approach this. So there are some terrain features in here. There are some, um, looks like other types of situations here where you might have lava. And then there's also lighting considerations. So let's, uh, let's put a grid on this. That's usually the first thing you want to do. Usually when I start with putting a grid on a map, if I don't know the actual dimensions, I'll just start with the default so you can go with uh, clicking on grid and then turn on the visibility. And what you'll notice is that the grid is way too small for this. So I'm going to go with 200 and see what that looks like because I think this map is a very high quality, high density map. So yeah, that's definitely a lot closer to, to what we want. So that might be a little bit small yet, depending on what scale you want this to be. But if you go with 300, which is probably your maximum uh, dots per inch, in this case, that looks correct. So 300 DPI is a little steep for a Fantasy Grounds map. You probably don't want to go any higher than 150, because when you start doing that, the file size for this map is going to be too big. So this already is too large, but I want to maintain the quality of the map as well as the, the colors and such, because if I lower the resolution too much, on the actual video, you can't really see the details much. And on this map, when you zoom in, it doesn't get fuzzy. So that that's the idea. So it just depends on what you're doing and what type of maps you have. So this is the cavern system. It is 
based off of the Kragma hideout, but in this case, it more, looks more like a, a frost giant's lair, if anything, or a, or a, a, a fire giant. So we might do something like that later. So I might add an encounter, and then also maybe an NPC fire trap. So if anyone falls in the magma, you have a way to deal with that. So this is a, a going to be kind of an exercise in just the, using the caverns. And the problem with this kind of map is that you're going to have a ton of data points. You got to be careful how many you place. So just like I showed you in the other map. So the first thing I'm going to do, I think, is just go around the periphery here on the very outside first, and then I'm going to work my way in and do some of the inner work. So not everything needs line of sight. This is actually outdoors. So we might have to mask that off so it's not affected by the lighting uh, for the inside. So first things first, I'm going to go to the line of sight tool, which is this brick wall. And in this case, I'm going to use the line tool, which is just going to be a series of connected points. I'm going to start in this top left corner and just single click. Doesn't have to be perfect. And then if you hold down the shift button, it'll make a straight line. Once you've done that, you just double click and that will end the line. Or if you single click, that will make the line to where it is actually uh, going to move for you and, and, and stay as a point. But I'm just gonna do the very outsides. So I'm just gonna do these three outer sides and then go from there. So I'm gonna click and it's already on magnetic snap. So if I click on this little square, it should technically work. And then I'm just going to double click and that ends that line. And as you can see, it's a lot straighter than it would be if you did it freehanded. So again, I'm going to single click. And then hold down the shift key and that makes it a straight line. And next, I'm going to go back down here and do the same thing. And again. So that just takes care of this outer periphery. And as you can see, I didn't um, overlap, which is a problem that you're going to face if you don't extend your lines beyond. So the lesson of this is that unless you are able to make like a vertice like this, you're going to run into problems. And it's really hard to tell when you're zoomed all the way out like I am. So that's some of the things that you're going to fight when you make maps, especially when they're big like this. That's going to be problematic when you play, and it's going to be problematic when you actually create the map. So what I want to do here is just extend these lines. So I'm just going to drag this. Oops. I got to be in selection mode. Take and drag that over. And then take this one and drag it over there. Now you get this vertice. And what happens is when you have those vertices like that, you can clean up the lines a lot easier than trying to hit the target. See here again, I missed. So this is something that you're gonna notice when you're making straight lines. So you want that vertice there, that's what you're looking for. And sometimes it doesn't come out right because you haven't connected those. And the only way to do that is really just to draw up, uh, past the location that you want to go. So like here, I want to come down just a little bit more. And that's where we got it. So when you're done with doing all your line work, you can go back and clean those up. So in, th in this case, if this was a map that it was a big dungeon, I'd do all the lines first and then come back and clean these up. So I'm just going to single click and hit delete on these edges. And if you have to, you can move these lines if, if they're off or if you think they're not going to work. So in this case, I can actually drag this square over and that will connect there. So it's just a matter of what your needs are and if you're going to be that picky or not. So if I 
take care of those points and then I don't like where the location is, I can always come back and drag these again and fi try to fix them and join them together. So you can do that after the fact once you've got all the lines placed because if you keep switching back between drawing and uh, adjusting, you're gonna it's going to take a lot longer to do these maps. So I'm going to go ahead and delete off these little leaders here. Just single click. And then if these points don't line up, what you can do is just single click and, and drag and drop them where you need them to go. And that should clean them up. So that's how you clean up your lines, like when you have straight lines. So that's something that you got to get in practice of. And as you can see, I overshot or undershot the lines. So what you want to do is draw them past where you think you need to go and then draw it past again. That way you're, you're positive that they've intersected. That's one of the problems that I had early on with Fantasy Grounds is I wasn't very um, agile with the, with the mouse. Like you have to actually have a little bit of manual dexterity. And then if you zoom the map out too close, you run out of room or you can't drag it all the way. And if you don't zoom in close enough, you're not, put, you're not clicking on the features that you want. So there's a fine balance between um, what you're able to see and when you're creating these lines and what you're able to place once you've done so. So rather than trying to start from this point here, I'm actually going to start outside of this area and just kind of click around this zone and not worry too much about where exactly these are points are going because this is a rough feature. It's not really anything that important and it's just a natural feature. So you don't need a lot of point data points. Might need a few because you got some indentations and such, but not too many. So I'm going to go to the line tool. I'm going to just kind of single click outside of here and just really mildly just kind of come through and, and create these little line vertices just so I have a rough outline so I can still see a lot of the detail when we approach this area is you don't want to have too many um, areas where it's right up to the edge. Like here's some of that, that glow from the um, lava. So if I go in too close to the edge, no one's going to see that. So that's important that you leave some of those features on this rough cave area just so you can kind of see what's going on with the map and you can see the beauty of it basically if you leave a little bit of this this room here. Now I'm not sure why that line stopped but that does happen occasionally so if that does happen don't panic. I'm just going to go back to the line tool click on that point and just keep going. I'm not sure why it got deselected. I might have accidentally double clicked and it does it's my mouse is a little sensitive so it does that occasionally but you will find little anomalies like that that'll drive you nuts if you need it to be a continuous line you just can hit control z which will undo it but you'll have to redo the whole line but i'm not going to let that bother me because i don't need it to be a necessarily be a continuous line so we're, we're kind of just going through the contour of the map we're not really doing anything really spectacular i mean there's no reason that you have to be super perfect in this case and right now this is where the elevation starts and stops so i'm just going to double click outside of here and end that line because you have a, a an area here that's actually going to probably be terrain because this is a loft with some stairs going up so you you would come back later and do your terrain after you're done with your your line work so I'm going to go ahead and keep continuing on the cavern. So this was this takes a while. Caverns generally take a while. So that's one thing about caverns that I don't care for is they're very time consuming. So I'm just going to continue from this point over here and just kind of click around just so I can still see some of the contour because I don't want it to I don't want to lose a lot of the the beautiful detail and some of this really cool shading and lighting that comes off this this lava here so even even if your players can move through the walls a little bit it's not not that big of a deal they can't go through it so this might be something that that you decorate and and kind of make your map more unique by not going too far out so so see i went past the line double click and i'm going to go ahead and continue down here do the same thing and try to go kind of more towards the outer parts of where the lighting is because I don't want to lose that detail is Chris when he made these maps he put a lot of thought into these details and if you go right up to the edge of the map they're really not going to be seen a whole lot 
So you want to see some of that variation in the maps. If you, you know, if you go right up to the edge of any walls or anything like that, you're really not going to see the the beauty and the detail of the map. It's kind of a waste, actually. Then you might as well just make your own um, with just no no life at all, just solid walls and no no detail. All right, so these are just kind of channels here, I guess. I'm going to leave those so they can be passable if somebody has like a fire resistance or maybe one of the the uh, fire giants has some lava creatures that they want to unleash on them. So I'm just going to leave those channels open, but I didn't have to do that. I could have certainly made those where they were closed off, but I want people to be able to see that detail. So that's that's why I left it that way. And you see, I'm not going right up to the edge of the lines here. I'm going around them so we can see the detail. So this is some pretty cool um, detail that are, that's in this lava map. So again, I'm going to come back here and just kind of cross the lines up there. So all I have to do later is go back and clean those up. If you think you're going to save time by being that accurate, it's not. It, it really does not. It doesn't compute, let's put it that way. Um, it, it's to the point where I'm getting less concerned about the accuracy and more concerned about the playability of the map and also just the functionality of it because just to have line of sight on the map and have a few details is more important to me than having it to be a hundred percent accurate i wouldn't even worry about it unless you're doing a commercial product or you're converting something for an official module then you might want to be a little bit more precise but you know if you're doing this for your homebrew games there's no reason why you need to have this to be super accurate so i'm going to go ahead and just kind of come around this periphery here and you can see there's a there's a staircase there even though there's a staircase you could go across that if you want but i'm going to avoid it in this case but as you can see there's some contour here where i might put a little bit more detail depending on what the area is so there's not a whole lot that i need to worry about with this because this is just another area see i double clicked on accident there that's why the line actually stopped so i'm just going to single click back in that same spot so I want to make sure I'm clicking in that square and then it'll just continue from there because that's what happens if you get a little click happy is you'll actually double click and that will end your drawing so that's something that you got to used to when you get proficient with with the map tools you'll do that less and less but you get a little click happy and then you start double clicking on accident and that's usually what how it happens i used to get really mad about that I'm, I'm i'm over it now it's not that big of a deal and especially if you're just doing this for your own table it's really just you know, a matter of getting used to the map tool and becoming um actually physically dexterous enough with your mouse to be able to plot these points because there's some of us that don't have good tactile sense and there's even people that, that are kind of unsure about how this works. So there's a lot to it. It's, it's not just learning the map tool. It's actually learning to be a little bit more um, artistic and finesseful with your with your line work and, and less worried about um, not so much the accuracy, but the playability and the ease of doing this. Because if this takes more than an hour or so, it's probably not worth it. And in this case, if I wasn't explaining and kind of taking my time, I would probably already have this part done. But I'm going to share this process with you guys because I think it's important that you understand some of the principles of using the map tools in Fantasy Grounds. And regardless of what virtual tabletop that you use, you're going to run into these types of things. I've seen people say, well, this is a lot easier in Foundry or it's better in uh, Roll20. Well, if it is, uh, that's fine. But that might be that you're practiced with it or that there's more tools or something for it. I don't know if there's any one tool that's better in, in a virtual tabletop. Now, there are mapping programs that are much more dedicated to this type of thing, which is fine, but it does not mean it's the same. It's The comparison is not the same. Fantasy Grounds, first and foremost, is a virtual tabletop. It is not a mapping tool. Although it's coming a long ways, it's certainly shaping up to be a very useful and handy tool if you need it. There's nothing that says you have to use it. And quite often when you buy content in Fantasy Grounds, it's generally done for you, so you don't have to worry about it so much. 
All right, so here we have these two volcanic chambers, and they're held by these iron gates here. So what I'm going to do is just create a line off of here and make a single line that's going to cut through, because I don't care if that gate is, is closed right now, because I'll come back later and put the doors in. So I'm just making a single line around here to make it simpler for me, and just crossing through that doorway and then just connecting where I can. And then I'm gonna do the same thing over here. So I'm gonna come off the wall here. Like I said, I'm just using the single line coming off here. I wanna make sure that this vertice is crossed, which I've done. I can always come back and delete those tails when I don't need them. So that's a majority of the line work. Let's take a look. So I got a little bit more over here to do, and then we're almost done. So here is the a loft where probably where the goblins sleep. So I can come off this wall here and double click here, maybe maybe come back here. You can do this if you need to, but it's not not essential. And there again I double click, dang it. So this is just something that you have to get used to when you're when you're using the line of sight tool. So there's nothing wrong with this void right here. I just kind of put that in there to show you that you can go back if you don't like something and you can add to it. You don't necessarily have to delete and start over. You can, you can actually add to what it, whatever it is as long as the lines intersect. That's the important part. It isn't so much that they have to be perfect. It's just that if they're blocking out the correct areas for your line of sight, that sort of thing. So you can come back and kind of fix some of these if you don't like where they where they landed. And that's something that you'll you'll discover and you'll get a little bit more accurate, but it's not really that that critical. So these are just some things that you'll learn as you go. So like these little tails that I created earlier, you can just single click on it and delete that. So that only deletes the segment. If you double click, it deletes the whole line. So single clicking on a segment should only delete that one little piece between the two points. If you want a whole line, you double click and it will select all the points. So when you want to delete a point, you just click single click. In this case, I'm just going to delete this little leg here. And that's all you have to do. If you wanted to get rid of this center line, you didn't want these two to be connected, you can create a line in the center. It's kind of extra work, but you can do it. So you take that and you create this extra line here, which is going to create a point. And then you're going to single, uh, you're going to make sure you're on the selection tool, double click. It'll take all three of these points with it or these other two. And then you single click this one in the center and hit delete. And that takes out that center line. So that's how you get rid of extraneous lines if you don't want them. Like if you wanted this to be changed, you can actually bring this up and over here. So you can move things around once you've placed things. And if you didn't want to, for instance, if you didn't want this whole segment over here, you could essentially go through and delete that out, but it's not worth the work. It's not worth the headache, in other words. So let's see, what else do we got to do? So I got to go back down south and check that out. So you guys have any questions, I'm willing to check the stream once in a while and, and answer questions if you want to leave that in the chat. I'm just kind of giving you some tips and such. I mean, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I got, you know, I got problems too. So um, I'm just trying to share with you experience and give you an idea of what sorts of things to expect from the tool. Like I said, I keep double clicking and it stops the drawing process. That's the one way that you stop drawing or you can hit escape. But in this case, I just keep getting too click happy and it just happens. So. So you can see I didn't try to connect on that point, I just crossed that line. So it's much easier to do that. Because then you can always go back and, and you can change the points and you can single click on the little tails to get rid of them. So that you're not constantly breaking stuff and worrying about it. And see this is outside of the map so I need to pull that in. I'm going to move that point and I'm going to move this point. I want it to be inside the map, not on the very edge or outside of it. And now you can see I have these little leaders again. So I'm just going to go ahead and single click, delete that point, single click, delete that point. So that's how you clean things up. So if you see stuff like that, you can always go back and fix it. So I'm going to go back to the line tool. I'm in the wall tool still. I'm going to um, finish this area here, which is the uh, some of the inner caverns. 
and then we'll worry about the outside a little bit. Maybe we'll put a little bit of terrain tools on the rocks and such. So here is where I can either try to connect at this point, or I can come down here and, and connect at this point, or I can even double click and cross that point and then come back later when I'm all done and, and delete that, that little vertice. So that's how you uh, kind of manipulate the lines, how you clean them up. And you can see when I zoom way in here, it's still inside the line, so I don't have to worry about that. You want to make sure it's inside the map zone, because that could be problematic when it comes to running the game. So here I'm going to um, delete this, and I'm going to delete that. So what happens is if you don't block that out, someone goes across this barrier, they're going to get stuck. Their, their token isn't going to be able to move, and you're going to have, if you're the game master, you're going to have to move it for them. So you want to make sure that the lines are right in these inside the zone of the map otherwise they'll get stuck and then you have to go and undo it and that's annoying during gameplay so i'm gonna go, i'm coming around here looking for little points that i might have left that i don't want anymore these are just little details so here's some tails here that i want to get rid of so just single click and it gets rid of those and you can see it's still within the line so that's good you may want to move some points around, so I'm in the. You got to make sure you're in the select tool, not the drawing tool. So I might want to bring these out a little bit because they're. It's kind of covering up some of the detail, so I don't. I don't want that. I want actually, the players to actually see some of that detail. So it also creates more room for your players to move around. So if you get right up to the wall and you have a skinny area, and it's not at least one square wide. When players go through there, they'll get stuck, and then you're going to have a big choke point. So unless that's your intention, you got to watch out for that. So these are just things that you'll learn as you play, as you actually use the map. So that's a whole other thing. Is It's one thing to create line of sight and all this stuff, but it's a whole other thing when you're actually playing uh, with the maps themselves. And I'll do a little bit of that during the tutorial. So outside, there isn't a whole lot of features out here. There is a, a rock, it looks like. So I might put a terrain tool on there if it was tall enough, but it's really not, so I'm not going to worry about it. So I might put like a big rock out here just to have a hiding spot, but nonetheless, it's, it's not necessary. And I'm try, not trying to create more work for myself either. So that is that. So there's the uh, line of sight for this particular cavern system. It is wise to go back and check before you move on to the next tool. So I have some um, characters. Let's see. I have the combat tracker. So I do have some heroes up here. I'm going to put them on the map temporarily just to kind of get an idea of what the lighting is going to look like. The other thing is when I'm in play mode, you have to make sure that the line of sight is actually turned on. So as you can see, once it's turned on, it looks pretty dim because there's no lighting in here. So I'm going to fix that eventually, but I'm going to at least put some players on the maps and just kind of get an idea of what's going on. So I'm going to take and drag them all down to um, at once with this little link here. That puts them on the map. When you claim a character, if they don't have line of sights or, in this case, lighting, they're not going to see anything. So a couple of these characters have dark vision, so that's why they're able to see this area out here. But the humans are not, so they have to have a torch or there has to be a glow. So what I'm going to do is every so often I'm going to put lighting in or the actual um, lava, which is going to go off a little bit of a glow. And then I'm going to put in um, some more lighting for certain areas. So first and foremost, I want to show you that when you have a situation like this, I'm going to go ahead and see this is what it looks like for a player that has no vision. And I've seen some people say, well, my player can't see anything. Well, that player has no candles, no torches, nothing. So if that's the case, they have to have some sort of lit um, effect on the combat tracker or on the token. So what I'm going to do is go to the um, effects, which is this uh, looks like a little, in this case, it looks like a, an effect button. And I'm going to give him a torch. So you can drag the torch to the token, or you can drag it on the combat tracker. And once you do that, now you can see around the area. So he has a torch, or in this, yeah, so when he moves around, he's able to see um, what what's going on around him. So here's the folk hero, the guy that actually has the torch. And when he moves, the lighting moves with him. So that's that's what you want. 
But what I'm going to do is actually light up some of this area. Because, and you see he has a little muscle memory because, or I, he has like memory of where he was. So he can still kind of see where, where his light illuminated. So he kind of has this grayed out area. That's from the lighting and from his vision remembering where he was last. So there's that. So that's something that you have to get used to is when you switch between characters or NPCs, they're all going to have a unique sense of light. So this is the dark vision. That's with no vision at all or no light source. There's dark vision. There's just a uh, guy that doesn't have any vision. And then here's a guy that has a torch. So that's kind of what uh, you got to get used to switching between those. All right, so that kind of gives me an idea of what it's going to look like. So I'm going to put a little bit of lighting in there, but first I want to take care of this ambient lighting. So we don't want any ambient lighting affecting the indoors, and we don't want anything indoors affecting the ambient lighting. So what we're going to do is go to the lighting tool, and I turn off these options when I'm working so I don't get confused. And when I'm in the lighting tool in this case, I'm going to go to ambient lighting, and I'm going to change this outdoor to probably like sundown or something, or maybe just daytime so I have I can see better. So I'm going to change the ambient lighting preset to sunlight. And then I'll lock that uh, layer so it doesn't get affected yet. And now what happens is when I go to play mode, you're going to see this outdoor area is, is pretty pretty lit up. But if you go inside with a character, these areas are lit up when they shouldn't be. And that's because the ambient light is affecting the indoor light as well. So what you have to do is create a mask and then reveal just the areas that you want affected by the ambient light. So again, I'm going into lighting and then I'm gonna to go to the ambient lighting and I'm gonna put a mask on. So this is only for maps that's you know all out. It's basically indoor and outdoor map. If this was all outdoors or out, all indoors, I wouldn't worry so much. But in this case, I'm going to worry about it. So I got the sunlight preset. I'm going to put a mask on, which covers the entire map, and it, it's basically blocking the ambient light. Then all I'm going to do is hold down the Alt key and just trace around outside, because this is where, um, where you may or may not want lighting to be. So I didn't do that right, but basically... That's how you masked it. So I masked the wrong area. So what I wanted to do is first I wanted to make sure that I have sunlight on and I'm going to create a mask. And what I want to do here is actually draw that thing out. I'm going to turn this stuff off so I can see what I'm doing. But I want to go to the lighting tool again, go to ambient lighting. I've already selected daylight, so that way this outdoor area can be lit up. But I have a mask on now, and what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna first get a majority of this. So I wanna uh, go into this area here under the ambient lighting and the outdoor. I'm gonna delete the temporary mask. Now I'm gonna bring it back. Right now it's on hide area. So I'm gonna hide this entire cavern network with just majority of it, I'm just gonna do with this, dragging the this big area first. And then I'll go do the, the little edges. So that takes care of a majority of the map. And then I'm just gonna um, freehand some of these edges around here. So holding down the Alt key, I'm just gonna come through here and draw around these areas here, which are not straight. And they tend to be more um, jagged. And that will help with that. So now when I go back and I change this over to light mode in play mode, this is what it should look like. And then if I bring a token in there, it's not going to be all lit up. Because if you remember before, it was showing the daytime in there. And that's not what you want. So that invalidates any lighting that you might bring in. And it also cancels out some of the um, custom lighting that you might put in here, like the glow from the lava. So that's just something that um, you'll learn when you work on maps that is both indoor and outdoor. So the only thing that's revealed through the mask is this outdoor area. Everything else is blocked out.
except for this little spot up here. I don't know how I missed that, but if I needed to fix that, I can go back to the lighting tool, go back to the ambient lighting, and in a selection mode, and you can redraw that, so it's not that big of a deal. So here's the ambient mask. You want to make sure you're on that layer, and then you're going to be in this layer here, and then you can draw that in. So you would go hide area, and that would hide that little spot that I missed. But there, there's just a, a little tip that would make it so that you, you would probably uh, benefit from that if you have a, a map that features both in and outdoors. So it's something that you have to be careful with uh, if you're going to make your own. So the next thing I'm going to do is actually add some lights in here. So I want to take and go to the map tools, turn off all of this this line of sight stuff first because I want to be able to see the whole map and you can do it as you go but it gets really cumbersome and it, it can be difficult to understand so I'm only going to put some glowing points in these main um, magma pools I'm not going to I might do one right here where all the rivers come together but other than that I'm not going to go all along this whole thing so we'll see so I want to go to the lighting tool add lights and I want to make sure that I'm not on any particular layer so I just clicked away and now it's unselected and then I'm going to do a preset which will be torch and then I'm just going to click where I want these lights the ambient lights to go or the lighting from the, the actual lava so there there I'll say there. So this is just so you have a little bit of ambient glow. I might put a little bit closer to the doorway so they can see some of that glow. And then outside, since it's daytime, you probably don't need it. But there again, it depends on if it's day or night. So you might put one outside here just to have a little glow. But other than that, there, that's about all I'm going to do. So right at the intersections and then in these glowing chambers here, that's where the, the most concentration of light is. So when I go back to play mode, once I turn it on, and let's go with a guy that doesn't have any light, so this human. Human Noble, he doesn't have any uh, light. So see, there's no lighting in there. But there is a little bit as he goes into these chambers because... Yeah, that's, that's what you want. So the lighting is only lighting up certain areas um, for the lava. So that may not be exactly what you want to do. You might want to put another ambient layer and then reveal that as they come in or do something like that. But in this case, that's that's the lighting I was going to put in there. So jumping back to the line of sight tool, which I probably should have stayed in that tool anyways, but I, wanted, I got pretty excited. I wanted to show you some of the, the lighting features. So I'm going to turn off the lighting features now. And I want to go to the terrain tool. So line of sight terrain and I'm just going to put a little terrain on this top part so I'll connect it with this layer here and it's one of those things where it'll create its own kind of shape so to draw it out as a you know as just a, a, a contour you need to use the, uh, the line tool All I'm doing is following the original contour. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. And then I'm going to go back and cross the, that front area so that it looks like a step or an area that needs to be revealed once they get up to the top. So once I get to that point, I'm going to come off of the 
line of sight like right right in here probably come off this point and use this as the contour for this particular level and I got a little bit too close to the edge so I'm gonna go and fix some of those lines but just to get a basic um, understanding of where this stuff is so now that I've done that I can go back to the selection tool and drag the points where I want them to go and I'm going to back them off a little bit so that we can see some of this. And if you can see, I kind of missed around these things. So I can fix some of these by just dragging in the points. Um, so it's really not that critical, but it does help with continuity and also with the lighting. It can throw it off a little bit. So I'm just going to you know, drag these to the points I want them to go. And it should clean that up. Yeah, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, it's just a, a little thing that I do for myself to kind of kind of keep things copacetic and Let's see go to there. and I'll have this one just stay there because I don't need to Necessarily need to move that but I can I'm gonna come over here and kind of fix these as well So all I'm doing is just dragging these to the original data points That way they kind of line up. They're already snapped to grid so I don't have to worry about anything like that and you notice these lights here, it's default is light, so I want to call this uh, Lava Glow so that I kind of have an idea of what it, what it's for. And then this stuff, this layer here, I'm just kind of going through and uh, working on these, these points so that they're lined up with the original wall. That way it's not a separate thing and on, on these surfaces. Surfaces. So there's that. And uh, there's that. So we're getting there. So there's some, you know, a little bit of legwork in this, but it's not, not too bad. I mean, you know, just kind of showing you how I do it anyways. You can find your own um, workflow. This definitely works for me. So this is something that will take some practice. You're not going to get it right away. I don't know so many people get so frustrated. Just they try it one time and then they drop it and they're like no i'm not doing it but you know until you practice with it you're really not going to know um, how you want to do it and that's what it takes is a kind of a methodology and some practice and it's really the best advice i can give you is to use the tool i don't know how many people i've asked when they come in frustrated and they're yelling and jumping up and down it's like well how much have you used the map tool they can't answer it because they haven't used it or they've used it make once and then they just give up on it. So it can be frustrating. I get that. But if you're not going to use a tool and then complain about it, it doesn't make any sense. So let's uh, take a look at this. So I think this is just going to be for the upper layer. I don't think I need to do this too many other places. I mean, there is an, a layer. Maybe these are, this is raised up, but it's not high enough to where, the, where it needs to be hidden. So the only loft area that's high enough to, to do that with is this staircase here. The rest of these uh, elevations are low enough to where you can probably see on top. So that's uh, a little bit of contour there. There are some maps, uh, you know, some pockets here where, where the characters can come in. Now I might need to um, go back and fix those doorways. So here these are like iron grates or something like that to hold the lava. So what I'm going to do is um, go to the door tool and just go to the line tool since these are at diagonals. They're not, I can't make a rectangle, so I'll just do it one manually. So I'm just going to take this and kind of go around the, the door and make my own little custom doorway there and here. So these are our doors that are shut to slow down the lava. I don't think it stops it, I think it just slows it down. Because even the iron would melt. Alright, so now when you want to get rid of this center line in anything like this, it's very similar. You have the line already in the center. And then if you want to go back and, and adjust these lines, you can. You don't have to be perfect on these doors. Matter of fact, if they're a little larger, that's good. Because when you go to select and move into this area, it's hard to click on it when you want to open it. So I'm going to go to the line tool. I'm in wall. I'm just going to draw a little vertice there, like a line across. And then on this other map, or this other door, same thing. 
and you do that for with all your walls and windows and such when you're when you're working on this and then go back and select a double click on this line here hit the delete key and then single click and then it gets rid of that center so you don't have to worry about uh, you know trying to manually chink it out so double click to get to select all these three points I'm going to hit delete. Now it doesn't delete the center point because it's part of another line. But if I single click on that center point and hit delete, it gets rid of the segment in there. And that's what you want. So once you've done that, you can go back to your play mode, turn back on your options here. I'm going to bring uh, bring one of the characters over that has actual line of sight. So I'm going to go with, we'll say the wizard because it's a elf. It has uh, dark vision so I'm using the arrow keys to move this around to check on the vision so it looks pretty good like it I can see the the contour of the actual cavern it's not right up to the edge where it looks like a black you know a black uh, wall or something like that where it's actually nothing you come through here okay it looks good I mean it, it's it's what it is what it is so he doesn't have torchlight that's why it looks all grayed out he has his dark vision, so that's cool. So I'm just kind of going around the map with the arrow keys to kind of see what's going on with the with the line of sight to check it out. And when you come up to a doorway such as this, the, the idea is that you make it big enough so if you're zoomed out, you can click on it. But if you make it too small, it's hard to manipulate. So now you come through here, now you're in that magma chamber which already has some natural light from that glowing in there. And then here's the other magma chamber. Um, so if anyone actually goes into that area, they can see this. So that's pretty cool. I'd probably leave those open uh, during gameplay because it's really hard to contain magma. I think those are just steps where magma slowed down. And they can shut it down in an emergency. So if there's an eruption, they can turn it down. They can actually close those cells and then get the heck out, and then they'll, they'll melt. It'd be like a meltdown, five mile island, three mile island. So there we go. So that's just the, the basic line of sight and the walls. And then over here, where I put the terrain, that's where in, in I think in Lost Mine of Fandova, there's a, there's a campsite up there. So that's uh, something that you would um, leave like this. The player wouldn't be able to see that until they get up to the top. Once they're up there, then you would open this you would open this up to them so that they can see the rest that way yeah so now they can now that it's open they can see everything so that's just a you know something that you'll notice when you're playing this green blob won't be there just because i'm the dm so that's why that's there and if we wanted to give him a magical light let's see cast a light spell so let's take a look at his uh character sheet here so see if he has light. All wizards should have light, even if they already have dark vision. You still need light to read. Okay, so let's go to actions. And does he have light? No. What do you know? What a bum. He's relying on his dark vision, which doesn't help if you're studying spells and such. So does he have any inventory? Let's see. Do you have anything in his inventory? I don't see anything. He's screwed. <laughs> Can't read his spell book unless he comes where this lava is. I don't know how close I'd want to get with my spell book uh, next to a lava pit. So anyways, he doesn't have the proper lighting to be in here. So not a good place for him to study spells unless he has candles or something. Well, let's get the uh, let's get this guy in here and see what it looks like. I think this guy has a torch. Yeah, this is the guy with the torch, so he can see um, accordingly. That's pretty cool. So he's gonna come over and say, "Yeah, you can borrow my my torch here." So that that's what they're gonna do. They're gonna they're gonna camp up here. What's nice and toasty, and uh, he's gonna use his his torch light there to share with the wizard, so he can study his spells. Then we were talking about a. Uh, a frost, or a, a, excuse me, a fire giant. I only got frost giants on my mind because of the the ream of uh, ream of the frost maiden campaign I'm playing. So, um, if you wanted to populate this with some with a couple um, fire giants, we could do that. So we go to the um, 
first I'm going to resize the map because it's all over the place. Once you have that sized, it's a good idea to kind of get it set. And I'm going to lock it and right click and recenter. So I'm going to go to view, zoom to fit. That's the whole map itself. Just zoom in just a little bit. And then I'm going to take and go with the um, encounters. And then I will um, create my own group. So I'll just say custom encounters. It's called group one. But if I go to the edit, I'm just going to go with uh, my encounters, which is the stuff that I'm making, custom stuff. And then I go to my encounters. And what I'm going to do is actually set up a random encounter instead of a set one. So what will happen is you'll get one or two giants depending on the number of players. So I'm going to go to random. And then uh, again, I'm going to make my own group, edit it. I'm going to call this uh, my randos or whatever you want to call it. My randoms, just so I have a title. And then I'm going to go ahead and create this. And what's going to happen is that I don't want more than two giants or three. So if I have a party of six, I want to have two giants. If I have a, just a party of five or less, then I'm probably just going to have one giant. So you can mitigate that. Let me see if I can pull up the NPCs first. So I want to go to giant. It doesn't necessarily have to be fire giant, but okay, here's fire giant. So fire giants are pretty powerful, so you don't want a whole bunch of them. So what I want to do is put in um, this thing here, this formula. So it's going to be the, a dollar sign. Uh, so we want it to be actually dollar sign PC. So what we want it to do is we want it to add or you know to create two if there's more than six players in the um, party sheet. So what what will happen is we can say that we can put the math in here where we can do a fraction or we can say one plus the number of PCs or we can go one and a half times. So you can change that depending on the syntax. So or you can just put one and not worry about it, but then you have to manually add another one. So what we want to do is we want to have um, one, uh, so it'd be one times the number of PCs, and then I think it would be divided by 0.5. That should do it. So let's see what happens with um, with the the players here. So I got to make sure they're on the party sheet first. Yeah, see, they're not. So they have to be on the party sheet. There we go. They were on there. And once you click this, it should compensate for the number. So if it's one and a half or less, obviously it's it's not going to work. We'll see. So that didn't work. That's because I didn't have the syntax in here. So what I want to do is change. Um, maybe it has to be 0 0.5. So I want to get rid of that so we'll just put a one there so dollar sign pc time or divided by one and a half that's probably what i needed to do so divided by 1.5 all right let's see what that works oh geez it's the other way so i need to go times 1.5 but that's basically three of them now that's not what i wanted so anyways you get the idea that you can you can do this so if you wanted like one for every two PCs, you just do it mathematically. So let's try the math. Let's try multiplication. So we'll do 1.5 asterisk. Let's see what that does. I know I had it backwards, so we'll see. Yeah, see, that's, that's the wrong direction. So <laughs> that actually multiplied too many. So you'd have to do a multiplier of like 0.5. That's that's what you want, and that that basically takes half of the the number of PCs. So, zero point five times the number of PCs. Gotta make sure that's a zero there, not a letter P. 
but you can add these kind of encounters in there to kind of compensate for the lack thereof or having too many. So there's two and a half. So that's close. So it depends on how many um, players you have, but this, this should probably be 0.3 instead of 0.5. That's kind of what I was looking for. So let's see what that does. So 0.3 should do it. 0.33. I think that'll do it. Yeah. So 0.33 is the, the answer. So for every three characters, basically, you're going to get a fire giant. So if I had another player on here, I'm just going to make a duplicate. And then I want to put the duplicate copy character in the uh, combat party sheet. Let's see if he's on here that work let's see no but if you have enough on here where you're actually you know you you have enough of the characters on here it'll work correctly so here we go so generate yeah so there's yeah there's another 1.65 so it that's a really powerful encounter by the way that's a even by itself i mean one one giant, but once you have that generated, um, you can have it. Um, you can send this over to the. Let's see, send that over to the combat tracker. That would just be one, so it doesn't take the fraction, and then um, that would be added to the the map. So if you wanted to take this bad guy and put him down here, there's his token, and then um, if you wanted to do like the lava. You can do traps. So if I come over here to NPCs, I'm gonna try a trap and see if it come what comes up. Yeah, so here's some traps here. So there's a rubble trap. So you can use that if rocks come down, if there's a volcanic eruption, or you can make a copy of this and change the properties of it. So instead of calling it a rubble trap, we'll call it lava. So if they fall in the lava, um, that's the, the damage. We'll call it lava hazard. And if you come down here, it, it'll say that, you know, if any creature that walks over or through the lava, change that. Without avoiding the um, lava, same, without avoiding the area. Don't need all that extra stuff. But anyways, you would do this 3D6, but instead of bludgeoning, you would change it to fire. And I'd probably go with f with 4D6. A little bit more lethal. Um, plus one, because we don't want it to be any less than four points of damage. Plus one. Oh, let's leave that back to where it was. 4D6. And then we're going to change that to fire instead of bludgeoning. And then what we'll do is uh, dexterity saving throw or from the lava. It's going to change from the lava pool. Or half as much damage on a successful saving throw. So it's a DC 10. I might change that to 12. Actually, 10 is good because it's pretty easy to to uh, avoid that within the lava lava pools. Rid of the rest of this stuff. I don't need. There's no trip wire. I'll say any creature that walks over or through the lava will burn and catch on fire. Something like that. And then it says any creature in the area, or any creatures within lava pool. So I'll just change that. Must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or take 46 fire 
damage or half on a save. So what's going to happen is no matter what, they're going to take damage. So what I would do is link this in the lava pools or somewhere on the map where it's centralized. And then when one of the players accidentally goes in there, I will take this this saving throw and just drag it over to one of the players. Let's say in this case it's the rogue. So he saved, but he's going to take half damage. So regardless, if I drag and drop this on the rogue, yeah, <laughs> he's actually dying because he, he he only had nine hit points. But that's how you'd set up a hazard. But anyway, so getting off track here, um, but that's basically what you can do with these maps is kind of make them your own. You don't have to use them for what they're for. In this case, this map was pretty cool because it was basically the Kragma hideout, but it was changed over to uh, a lava-like situation. So then you want to lock your layers in case so you don't move anything. And then your, your, your uh, play mode, if you want to turn that off so you can kind of see what's going on. As I was in the player view. And then if you need to see the whole map and work on it, you turn all that off. So there you go. Hopefully that helps you guys, gives you a little inspiration and a little insight on how the tool can be a problem or it can work for you. But generally, just practice with it. That's the best best way to, to learn how to use it. Um, these videos are not perfect. They're not produced. These are all voluntary. So if you don't like something that was done in here or something that was said, you can make your own as far as I'm concerned. But anyways, take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. Um, join in the David Middleton Memorial Con this weekend, May 13th through the 15th, 2022. Uh, the website is on Warhorn, so you can register and get in some games this weekend. There's probably a few more going on tonight, which is Saturday, and then tomorrow, Sunday. So take care, everyone, and hope to see you.